where it end, uh, ends up being product design, digital product design at the end. Those are the three timelines for me that defines what is design and what is the background on design. Could be other ways. I'm missing a lot of things in between. I'm missing a lot of men, a lot of women that worked a lot, that mark everything in between. Like I said, this is a personal perspective. This is what I think are the main backgrounds of what is to be designer in our days. But a little bit more about design. I, I love the word tangible. In English, I, I don't like it in Portuguese. I never say it's, it's in Portuguese doesn't mean that much, but in English, I love it. Tangible, something that you can see, you can perceive. And you, can, you can feel that it's something that you're delivering. And design, it's something that you will deliver. We'll deliver something tangible. That's the whole thing. Either it's an interface, digital product, either it's a physical product. The whole thing, it's you will deliver something tangible. I love that. What it is good, bad, whatever, it's something tangible. So we have some guidelines. We learned that some guidelines at school. Those who went to college mostly learned some of those guidelines. But something that, that I've learned over these 20 years, every one of us, it's different. The, we work under the same rules, but we think differently. I, like, I didn't put this here, but I like to think we are all prima donnas. Every designer has a prima donna inside of them. It will bitch the hell off a good idea. I will put them out there. I will fight for, for the good idea. I will try to make it a good project if it is something with the heart, because I create something, something that came within you. Something that has some basis, and that became some, some, sometimes it's perceived like being stubborn, like being a little uh, not, not cooperative with the team or something like that, but it happens in a lot of times, and every designer does the same briefing differently. Whatever the background, I, it's, it's about gender, it's about background, it's about cultural differences. That's why you have southern design, Italian design is different from the Nordic design, the US does a lot of things. It, and most of them are doing the same thing. It's a chair, it's, it's a furniture, it's a, it's a table, whatever that is, it might be different. It is the same briefing, it's the same problem that you're solving. So at the end, every design is different. The, the human aspect, it's really, really important. And being different, it's all about design. The last, it, it's all about design, no matter the support, no matter what you do. I've done a lot of things, big scale, small scale, it's all about design. It's all about having a concept. It's all feeling good about the project, about the client, about the outcome, and putting everything in the same package and be finish the whole thing from zero to 100 in a good way. It's really hard. I've had really, really rough projects, clients, things that went really bad. I have one right now. It's not going really well, and I'm here doing the presentation. So everything goes up. And another thing that I like to put out is, who did work with this? Scale the rules. A lot of fun, right? They have them for pixels as well. But I haven't seen them, yes, but I haven't seen them, the shape of the triangle. I wanted to, <laughs> to, to, to find something with the shape of a triangle with different resolutions over. So you should flip it. So this is on an iPhone, I should do this. On a, on, a, on a regular skin, I should do that. But they have it in pixel. Because for me, units are really important. And the concept of design, on my mind, it's this. Something that that's puts everything on the same playing field. I've done a lot of different things. And for me, the difference on design, it's on units. It's just that. This is the core difference. When you do design for a house, you do it in millimeters. When you do an interior design, normally it's centimeters. A meter, it's too long. When you do a house, an architect, using meters. When you do landscape, it's in acres. So when I feel doing all different fields over my career, I think this is the most different. When I start a new illustrator project, when I do a lot of illustration things, in it, when I do something graphic, I do it in, in, in millimeters or centimeters. Depends on the size. I did these billboards in centimeters. But I, I did the badge on, on the badge on on on, uh, on a lanyard. I did it in millimeters. It's a smaller one. It's all about the scale. It's all about the scale. So the the main difference. This is one thing that I want to point out. And another thing that I want to point out: UX design. It's not design. Okay. This is not design. Every field of design that I pointed before has UX within it. 
User-based design, it's what we do. We do things for humans. We do things for users, for people. So if you call yourself user design, I did it in the past because it's easier to pass the message so people that don't understand your, your crafts so when you do digital projects, it's really easy to say I'm a UX design, it's trendy, it's easier for people to understand. I do it the same mistake, but I don't like to use it. I don't like to call UX designer because everything in base is UX. This is kind of those bad words that came out 10 years ago, something like that, to postpone a different field and to create a new field of job. But at the end, design is always design. Every field. When you do a chair, you, do, you don't call UX, you do ergonomics. It's the same thing. It's what you learn in school. Ergonomics, it's how people feel, it's how people use, how people interact with the chair. How people see the texture, the materials, the, all this, it's user-based design. It's what UX is all about. If, if you go to U Wikipedia page, I dare you, it's the first, the first paragraph. UX design came from ergonomics and has a background on that. Just read it, because it's really simple. And that, for me, this is something that I'm not going to be further. It's a discussion for a different talk. I know it's people don't, don't really go with it. There's a lot of different thoughts on this. This is my view on it. I wanted to put this out there as a personal perspective. But more. So what makes a brand iconic? It's more than a logo. Iconic brands tap into values, aspirations, desires, mythology. They foster an emotional connection that leads to loyalty and purchase. Yeah, yeah, but how do you make a brand iconic? With the fundamental elements of design. Let's start small with a simple point. What's the point? Together, points make a line. Line has direction, weight, gesture. Gesture? Spirit, gestalt, line. Lines then combine to make two-dimensional objects that we call shapes. Or an outline? Or a silhouette. These shapes are regular and geometric. Others may be irregular and organic. When put together, shapes can define one another. You mean they contrast? Right. Contrast is a fundamental principle of design. The juxtaposition of dissimilar elements creates tension. Sounds easy enough. Well, it isn't just black and white. These colors are organized in a wheel that maps complementary tones like warmth and cool. Color is defined by hue, how we normally reference color by names, like yellow and green. Saturation, the dominance of hue in color, and value, otherwise known as lightness or darkness. Color is the first element the mind sees and the last it forgets. Yeah, but how do I pull this all together? Composition is emphasis on a focal point against a background strengthened through scale. Whether radial, symmetrical, or asymmetrical, Composition is... This is getting exhaustive. Then let's speed up the rhythm, which provides order in composition. Repetition and variation in groups creates a pattern. And what if you need to get more specific? Spell it out. Typeface, whether traditional serif or a modern sans serif, can act as a product's voice. And if that falls flat? Form is the three-dimensional partner of shape. Forms can be basic, complex, and often merged together. On this surface, we find texture. Matte, glossy, rough, smooth. Kind of seems like a whole new world. Negative space creates a mold around the positive space of form. OK, but should we use all these tools at once? No. Aim for harmony and simplicity, the concert of separate elements. Design is the careful balance of these principles. Our goal is to create clear, consistent emotional connections. And with a common visual vocabulary, we can make brands iconic. You've got it. OK, forget, forget about the brand part, but this is the basis of design. This is what I'm talking about. Every one project, if you do the next app that you're designing, aren't you use all those elements? Aren't you use lines, typography, color, contrast, rhythm, white space, balance? We do the same in this background that actually exists. I put the, the characters in the middle, I have the logo with, with different typefaces, I create rhythm with it. It's all about the same thing. It's all about con design, it's all about the same thing, no matter what you do. No matter if you're designing an app, a website, if you control those elements, if you learn how to craft them, you'll be able to do every project of design that is out there. You can base any creative thought 
based on that. And those fundamentals, if you are not a designer, if you work with designers, if you're in engineering, I hope some of you are, you've heard about this and you asked, okay, why is this this? Why do you use this font? Why do you use this space? Why is the balance? Why is the square? And sometimes we have some hard time to explain because it feels right. It feels the balance that they say as in the video. The balance is something that you get a feel, you, get, you, you have understand. That comes with experience, of course. It comes with a lot of knowledge. It Come, comes slowly within, within the work that you do over the years. But when you get to my point, 20 years over career, it, it's, it becomes a little bit easier. So for young designers, I understand. I struggled a little bit in the beginning, and I did a lot of shitty jobs in the, in, in the beginning. <laughs> And I now understand why. And this is the fundamentals. This is why design it's all about. No matter the basis, no matter the, the medium, the support, this is what it's all about. But there's another thing that I want to talk about, the process. No matter the goal, we all use the same process. No matter the support, if you're doing a product design which is made of glass, or you do the product design, which is made of pixels and bytes and bits, and it's going to be behind the screen. Either it's an app, a website. It's all about being, it's all about the process. So. This is the first Apple computer mouse. It came with Apple's $10,000 Lisa computer, and it was designed by a product design consulting firm that would eventually become known as IDEO. The assignment was straightforward. They had to take the computer mouse, a $400 device at the time, and bring it down to under 35 bucks, make it mass producible and reliable. And above all, it needed to be simple. We control Lisa by pointing to these images on the screen with this unique item called a mouse. Fast forward about 30 years, and IDEO doesn't really create products anymore. They've transitioned to designing networks and experiences, things like Los Angeles's voting system and the Red Cross's method for finding donors, even entire schools. So what does making a computer mouse have to do with creating a school system from scratch? It turns out, quite a lot. The world we live in is one where really the complex things are the things that are mostly broken, not the simple things. We have lots of great products, uh, lots of beautiful products, lots of products we can use every day. Everything from you know furniture to, to, to tableware to consumer electronics, they're mostly pretty good, right? They're, and yes, there's opportunity to do better and do more, but I'm interested in the things that don't work very well and the things that you can impact society with, and they're mostly the more complex things. Back in 1971, a designer named Victor Papenik wrote a book called Design for the Real World. The premise was pretty simple. Creators could take some of the same design strategies from the creation of industrial products and use them to tackle problems like pollution and overcrowding and food shortages. By 2001, IDEO had done just that, pivoting from products to real world experiences. But the design steps? Tim Brown says they stay just about the same. The first piece is observing the world in order to ask an interesting question, right? I mean, and you can observe the world in lots of different ways. When we talk about human-centered design, we're really talking about observing the way humans live their lives and asking interesting questions about, hey, why does somebody do this and not that? Or why is somebody struggling with this problem? Why, why is it hard for somebody to open that? Uh, uh, struggle, are they, why are they struggling to open that jam jar lid? Well, so maybe I could redesign the jam jar lid, right? Or maybe I could give them a tool to help them, right? So. So why is this happening? So the first step is that uh, looking at the world and coming up with a good question. For making a mouse, that means watching how people use computers and observing what they want and what they don't. For designing a school, that meant spending a month in Peru, meeting with students and parents, teachers, investors, government and business leaders to address needs like academic planning, modular classroom space, accessible technology, and affordable tuition. The next step is taking all the insights you have about those questions and starting to imagine ideas, like here's what I could do, here's what I might imagine doing better or differently. So that's what we often call ideation or idea making. Then comes the fun part, you test it out. Right at the beginning of the process, that might be a really simple cardboard model or a quick sketch, or if it's digital, it might be a quick digital simulation or something, and you try it out with people. Sometimes those drafts can be pretty rough, 
The first prototype for the mouse was a roll-on deodorant stick and a butter dish from a Palo Alto Walgreens. Then you test it and say, is it, it doesn't work. Okay, so I need to rethink my idea and I do it again, right? And this is where the iteration comes in. Like you, you learn from the prototype, you realize what's not working, or maybe it's a crummy idea, you have to go back and find a new idea again. And you go through that loop over and over again, asking the question, having ideas, prototyping, learning, and, and until you get to something that truly meets somebody's needs or a set of people's needs. Now, the only the, the last bit of the process, which which arguably happens in that iteration, also is the storytelling piece, right? Because always you're trying to explain to people why your why your idea is interesting. Macintosh, the computer for the rest of us. I think what you need to design a complex system is not one brain. You need lots of brains. You need lots of brains with different perspectives, different creative contributions that they make, working together to get to an outcome that is that is literally rich enough and sophisticated enough to be able to behave like a system instead of being like an object. Okay, like I said, it's all about the process as well. IDEO, it's one of the companies that I really love, I follow, um, and they, and they somehow draw a lot of attention for design thinking. And the design thinking that you know today, it's based on concepts that they create. Tim Brown, it's one of the guys that I really admire. And he, in this video, explains a little bit about the process. The things that I was saying before, different support, different, mean, dif different bases, you can do it either for a mouse, either for the school system either for a chair, either for an app. It's the same process, and this process starts, as, as he said, in observation, ideation, prototyping, and testing. I would add, like I was taught in school, the other lists, briefing problem, meeting with a client, if you're working with a client, making what is your briefing, what, what is the boundaries what you're working with. Research, it's really important. Today, we, we take research as a granted, because there's Google, Back in the days, in 99, when I did, I had a closet full of brochures and catalogs and all that stuff. Back in the days was the research that you do. You, would, you went to fairs and you collect a lot of things, magazines. You, I've paid a lot of money in the early 2000s for magazines to stay in touch with the trends, with everything. It was crazy. I still have a lot of them, but it was crazy. It's a different time, but it's all about research. Today, we research most about blogs, about everything that we follow on social media and all that stuff, but it's really important. And we don't take that as important to our day job, but it's really important to stay up to date with everything, to sketch, to project, to prototype, to produce, to deliver. This is the process. This is the same process no matter you, what you do. So whether you're a product designer for physical objects, or you're a product designer for digital products, the process is roughly the same. I found another thing in my ethics. This is one of the, the, the books that I read in the, in the final high school. It was from 83, and in Portuguese, sorry. At the end, you see, it's the same process, 83. So they say, uh, I will say in Portuguese, desenvolvimento alternativas projetuais, verificação da seleção de alternativas, some details, prototype, you change a prototype or you interact with prototype and then you fabricate you, the whole thing. It's the same. It's, it's more than 20 years ago. So it's the same thing. What is the IDEO, IDEO talked about the movie? It's about the process. So the process is really important and it stays the same no matter what you do. It's one of the key points. That with elements, it, it becomes what is to be a designer in our days, no matter the medium, no matter the support. So. We've talked a little bit about the past of design to give you uh, a frame of what is to be a designer. We've talked about the fundamentals. What is the fundamentals of a design project? It's those elements, no matter what, what you do. It is 3D, like a big project, architecture, it's a landscape, urban design. It's really big on scale. It's urban landscape design, what is that? It's really big. The process for me, it's really, really important. So let's try, try to sum up some of the differences. Product design and product design, analog and digital. 
in 99, when I started, there's another typo. It was ideation and this ideation. Typo, <laughs> fundamentals and the process. So ideation is, was different back then because it was, I didn't have so many tools. The medium, in the, it's different between those things. It's, it's different to understand where you about, we evolved a lot in the last 20 years. It's really different. It's the same fundamentals with different tools. We work on different sets. We work on software. It's um, way more advanced that, that we had back then. The process, it's different, and, but the, the perspective, it's different, but the process is the same. So basically, it's same goals, different outcome. So the goals, it's what's, it's what's behind being the designer. We all have to deliver tangible objects at the end. We do projects, so it's the same goals in the core being a designer. The outcome, it's different. We are a different society. When you do digital projects, the outcome is really different. But when you see more differences, I trend, when you do analog projects, it's trend, more trends different. We see a lot of trends right now in digital. At the end of the year, everybody is going trends. But in product, when you do fashion, you, it's trends based. When you do tableware, it's trends based. When you do some of furniture, it's trends based. So everything goes behind. What's best in selling? Fashion is the, the best example. But in digital project design, it's data-driven. It's more on data. It's, it, you use a lot of data to build products, to design products. It's more about the data. What is happening out there? What do you have? Like uh, raw material it could be data. In analog, you have a better understanding of the final user because it's more out there. It, it's what we've been using for so many years. We know what is best for us. We know what is. You can change the material that is best. In, in uh, digital product design, it's user-based, mostly. It's closer to innovation, to material innovation, because uh, a lot of differences you see in the past years it, on engineering, it's on materials research. There's a lot of new materials out there, and that changed the way you design things. But digital product design is close to innovation. It's close to. Um, the things that's bleeding edge innovation. It's, it's really, really a uh, difference when you approach the projects in that, in that perspective. And uh, when you do analog, it's more about the ambience, it's more about the location, it's more about where you put your object, where it's going to live in, within, it's going to be read outside, inside, it's going to be seated, it's going to be used where, how. And the interface, it's more, uh, this digital is more interface dependence. That's what we used to about. It's always to see on the screen. Okay, not on the screen, everyone. I know there's a lot of things different because it's voice, like Chris Messina saw in, in his talk earlier today. Uh, it's different, but it's more device dependence. You see digital things always on the device. But more. Uh, in, in, pr in, in production, it's really, really hard. You take more care when you produce the object. When you do the project, an analog project, you have to be really, really careful when you do. In, in, it takes. The time to market is different, so you take a little bit more care in this. And digital, the continuous integration, it's what makes the difference. When you ship something digitally, it's really easy to, to change. Once you send something to the printer, it's out there. You cannot change. Once you produce a mold for a plastic, which is really expensive, you cannot change it. It's done. Uh, and that's a huge difference in the mindset when you do the project. It's a huge difference. That's why it's hard to produce. But when, once it's out there, it's produced, you take a huge lift out of your shoulders. It's there. You shift it. It's on the factory. You cannot change anything. Right? When you do digital product design, once it's shipped, you feel the pressure. Now the users will come. Now let's see what's happened. You just, in a minute, you do uh, hot fixes in production. You, do, you submit a new thing for the App Store to change the app and change the stress. You have a lot of stress before the project in analog. And and digital have a lot of tests after the shipping. It's really different. It's, it's something that you feel quite different. And it depends on raw materials. It's because it's a material based and it's different. You, you have to think about um, the world, uh, about the sustainability. You have to think about which materials, raw materials, the price. There's a lot of different variables in it. And the um, digital product depends more on software. So it's bits and bytes. It depends more on how the hardware and software will combine the evolution. That can be um, quite a difference. But 
there's another differences that, that I want to point out. Market ready, it's because when you do the product, when it's ready, you can put it in the market. When you put it on stores or sell it online or whatever, it's something that is, once it's produced, has to be sold. No matter what, the idea is to sell something, to put out that your product is going to be out there. If you're doing the house, it's ready, you can redo it a little bit later, but once it's done, it's done, no matter what. It, digital, it's about new markets. You are always exploring new frontiers. You're trying to create new ways of interacting with your products. You're trying to create new interfaces, new things. It's all new, new markets because you will reach something that wasn't there before. Before Google, you wouldn't search, search the same way. Before uh, the iPhone, you use the digital product the same way. So it, that evolution in digital, it's really, really different from the, the both worlds. Established markets, what I mean with this, it, it's because it, it uses established ways of delivering, shipping, it's logistics, it's, uh, it's out there and will be out there for a long time, as long as we work as society as it is today. But in digital products, I feel there's a bigger and quicker impact. Once you ship, you can ship for all over the world in a click of a button. It's out there. The internet, the communication makes a lot of differences. Because in, in, when you do hardware, you put something, you produce, you have it on the shelf, it takes a lot of time to, to go it out there. People will see photos of that, but to experience, you have to buy it, you have to wait for them to, to come to your house, or you buy it at the store, and you have to take the unpacking, all that stuff. Yeah, you design things differently when you do both things. And, you, and I call the logistics in, in product design, it's about that. It, it's hell. It's really hard to, to come around. And you as a designer, you have to think about that. If you design something that will be on the market two years from now, because it's going to take two years to produce, it's really hard to understand that after one year you cannot change anything, and because you have to think about production, details, logistics, deliver, uh, 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 how long, how it, it will fit on, on, a, on a pallet or not, it's big enough, it's how it fit in a box. <laughs> you as a designer, you have to think about it when you design something. But in, in a digital, it's scalable, and that's what I'm saying. When you put the product out there, it's shipping for all over the world in the click of a button. It's really, really, really simple, and that's, that's important. So let's try to sum up a little bit what I mean with this. Um, over the last 20 years, I've been designing, uh, and I, I realized over, over the years, small differences. I'll be thinking about them when I get older, but when you're doing a day-to-day -day work, you don't think about them. And when I proposed this talk, I was, I was thinking, should I talk a little bit about the differences between the two worlds? Is it relevant or not? When I do some research for the talk, I found small, subtle differences when I think about the, the, the differences and the, the, the same thing, the similarities. Um, it makes sense to talk. It's a simple talk, but it made sense for me to mark it the 20 years and to mark some personal experience about it. So, different support, different tools, different outcomes. This is true for both ways, but it's the same process and the same goals. You always want to deliver the best product out there, the most creative, the best thing, the best new thing. Every designer wants to put it out there. There's no other way of thinking. But the differences sometimes can make you do more of one thing, feel comfortable with one thing. I, I really love to do digital. I really love to do apps. Let's start with apps. And falling in the, in the comfort zone sometimes could be tricky. Uh, to change the little, after three or four years doing the same thing, I feel like I need new, new challenges. That's why I do a lot of different things. That's why I help. I, I'm, I love doing pixel scan because of that. It's a way of breaking the year and do different things <laughs> over again and do, doing the layout of the event and doing that. It's one good example. I do a lot of more things. Out. But what I mean with this is that at the end, we are all looking working for human beings. So when I talk about user experience, it's about human. It's about delivering something that's for human use, consumption. That's what design for me is all about. Human could be dogs. You can design a dog. Okay, humans has a sense for living, for using, for experience. So you have the responsibility to, to take it to the, next, to the next level, to shape a better world. It's up to us to do this. I've been told this since day one of college. So you're shaping the next one, but it's true. It's true. 
every one of us designers together build what you need new for society. So we have a small amount of responsibility. When you do something like recycle, we, if we all do, we can change the world. As a designers, you have the same goal because we do the things that people will use, how they use and what they use. So we shape a little bit about that. So about that, it's, it's, important, it's important to have the responsibility. You have to take that. Sometimes you do projects really lightly and somehow you don't take them seriously because of the clients, because of money, because it's, you, it's not being well paid. Every job should be taken with a lot of responsibility, no matter what. Because at the end, it's your work, it's your name, it's the thing that you put out there. That's why ethic in, in ethics in design, it's been talked a little bit, but it's not a big topic. It's something that, that I've been following. It's something that we should take care of that when you, do, when you design something. It's about sustainability, it's about gender, it's about the whole new things that we as a society want to change. But, like I said, I don't like bullshit things around design, like I said. Uh, design for me, it's plain simple. It's those fundamentals with those process. It's so simple as that. So when you're thinking about something new, please don't come up with a name for it. Don't say it's, I'm doing digital product, I'm doing industrial, I'm doing graphic. I know we have to differentiate what you do in core. It's easier for people that don't design to understand what you do. You have to frame it somehow. Hey, I, I want to do typeface. I'm a typeface designer. Wait, it's, it's really. But it's the same fundamentals. It's the same process. This is really important. And I, I, I think many of people that don't understand that the core is the same. But sometimes the magic comes in within. I think this is the source of the magic of design. And a good product always comes the relationship between design and engineering. Those two combined, good empathy, good relationship, good teamwork, it's the source of every good design project. Whatever it's digital, whatever it's product-based, I've learned this over the years, and I really nurse the relationship that I have with my colleagues, they are designers, I really love it, and I think this is the, um, the source of it. But a couple of last things. Um, I've said the, um, the digital revolution has a big impact. Probably uh, we are witnessing a new revolution with digital. We don't know yet what's going to come for our children, our grandchildren, but we probably we are witnessing some sort of revolution that's big or bigger than digital, I believe so. So that might change a little bit the way it changed craftsmen to designer, it might change something about the design process. It will change something about the mindset. We will be interacting with robots. We will be interacting, in, interacting with a lot of things. So we are on the verge of a new revolution that might change the, the things that I, I just said here today. Um, and that's something that scares me, but I'm really excited about that as well. And when I talk about technology, it's because it changed the way we create, we work, we communicate, and we live. And that's together will change the, f the way we design. Some, somewhere in the future, the process, the fundamentals will change. I know it's for humans. I know it's the same outcome, but it might be changed when you're designing something for machines, for instance, because you're designing something for robots, not for humans. That might be different. That might change something along the way. That's something to think about it. And uh, no matter what, we always have to say in the future, I know it's for machine, it might change, but we as society has a change, has something to say about it and can and will do deliver a better world, I hope, for every one of us. So that was something that I wanted to talk about. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> it was simple, but I hope I think okay. Thank you. Do you have any questions? No? Thank you.